Hello, again, disability gang. We have now, if you watch Shane's video first, now you have Aaron. If this is the first video watching, you're starting with Aaron, the illustrious creative writing masterpiece maker, Aaron Soros. Where do you like to say that you're affiliated with? Oh, I'm, at the moment, I just left Cornell. So my bio yes. is, I'm always in the mission. Uh, I just left Cornell, and I'm now at Simon Fraser University. That's in BC, yeah? That's in BC. Perfect. Perfect. The campus, I'm in Vancouver, the campus is in Vancouver, and Vancouver, okay. and I'm a fellow of public humanity. Such a Fancy. lovely title, and I wish it was just like a life message. Right? Fancy. So you'll remember from our lecture last week that Erin is the one who writes about psychotic experience, and she's written in every literary journal that we have in the North American context. If you <laughs> can name it, it's there. And she's won about 3,000 awards for it. Her and Shane have that in common. If you can win money writing, they want it. So we're really, really happy that they're here to speak to us, right? And I'm going to remind you, just like I reminded you after Shane's lecture, that we want to take a second to honor and think about the ways in which we give gratitude or give thanks for when people supplant our knowledge with their lived experience stories because I think and we've said this for a couple weeks that there's a big problem with the ways that lived experience when we're looking in the academic context get co-opted back into academic literature for the wrong reasons right so if we have speakers like Aaron and Shane with us who are sharing these really tough experiences like Shane's son or Aaron's piece about institutionalized rape and how the institution works for people in Mad Gang. We have to think about how we're honoring that beyond being able to cite it or being able to remember it. How are we giving gratitude and how are we improving ourselves and our communities using the knowledge that they give us? So if we're thinking about that while she's communicating with you her lived experience, that would be a really good exercise. And I'll remind you again that that goes beyond the spoken. So when you're thinking about your write spaces and your exam activity, you want to be thinking about how to write in gratitude beyond being able to name her or cite her. I literally give thank you messages in the middle of articles when somebody has shared something really difficult. And people don't do that, but I guess I'm asking you, why don't they do that? So whatever interventions you wanna make as to gratitude and LXP, I invite you to think about. Aaron's style here is a fireside chat, and that basically means we're just gonna talk until you get bored and turn us off. If you last the whole 60 minutes, I appreciate it. I'm sure Aaron would appreciate it. I hope you stay here. Um, I'm holding a pillow just because I find psychotic experience and institutionalization hard to talk about. Aaron might also struggle with that, so we're honoring her for being able to do that with us. And Aaron, do you want to jump in and say anything before we just have a chat? Oh, hi everyone. Um, yeah. I love it. Welcome. Welcome to our cozy space that we are so good at welcoming people to now, right? Domino, we're good at it? Yes, he agrees. Don't worry. So if I were to just start with one of the student questions and we can perhaps bounce off or see where it takes us or bring in other students as we keep going, I will not say your names. The questions are anonymous. Um, if I wanted to start here, one of the questions I really liked was, how would you say your experience as a woman or women presenting impacted your experience in the psychiatric system? Yeah, I like that question as well. And I think that relates back to the essay of institutionalized rape. Um, because my sense 
sensitivity, my experience as a woman working as a rape crisis counselor, and thinking deeply about consent, thinking about my own body and thinking about its histories of violations or moments of testing a boundary. And so I have my own interior experience as a woman. And then I was also thinking about the structure of the psych ward and how I think I mentioned in the essay that as a woman, the police and the psych system was sort of working to protect me. And then my constitution as a white woman, that I'm being protected in some way. They think they're doing this work to control what could happen to me. And this was said to me directly, that I could uh, get, be raped, I could be abducted, something could happen that I'm vulnerable and, need, and needing of care. Um, and, and I think that structure is slightly different for men and people who are um, who communicate differently from a, a quite a small bone woman, so people are not coding me as physically threatening to others. That was never, there was never a sense articulated to me that I was a threat to others. It was always that I could get threatened myself, um, or that I could be putting myself in situations that I could be vulnerable. So doctors would be worried that I would speak to strangers when I'm crazy, and the strangers, of course, where violence happens, and violence never happens at the university, ever. So if I mentioned that I was talking to somebody I met on the street, there would be this lot of anxiety about that from professionals. Whereas if I said I walked home with somebody I just met at a, at a, at a social event on a university, no psychiatrist would say, like, you just walked home with a complete stranger, because yeah. there was a way that the university was going to the state, which a lot of people from marginalized communities know that's not the case. But there was a sense that when I moved, I always, always moved outside of the university space because I, I inhabit and speak to people who are homeless, who are, I, I worked out with men who were in prison, so I was working out in the gym where the men were on day leave. So I was always in these other communities. And I kind of knew better how to edit that when I was in other spaces. But when I'm mad, I will mention people from other communities. And they are actually people that I have known for years, but suddenly they become dangerous to me. Yeah. And the, so the markers are about gender, about race, about class, and my place within all those structures. And who is dangerous to the mad woman? It's not coded as a professor. It's coded as the someone in the guy in the gym who lives in prison. It's going to be dangerous to me. And I'm like, this is someone I've known for six years. So it was interesting to me this sort of anxiety of me to protect me as a woman. Yeah. And then my anxiety around my own body and my body's history and how that history became more painful in a hospital. Um, and then I was also thinking of the role of belief and women. And my, I was thinking of women as a structure of non-belief, like, like even that hashtag, I believe women. Yeah. It's like, um, A, I don't like that hashtag because it's sort of like, well, it kind of negates our subjectivity. Like, we're not always believable. We don't always know what we're talking about and what anyone else does. It's just, I don't like making totalizing frameworks like that. But the fact that we have to assert that is that the other, it's saying that the contrary is usually the truth, that I don't believe women. And the way that women are not believed, historically, or the way that our trauma and our violence is not considered political or trauma and violence. But if I came home from a war and had symptoms that led to psychosis, they, they wouldn't have thought, well, the Iraq war didn't exist. Whereas when I'm in a psych ward and I'm saying, well, this happened, and I'm actually being tested by in court next week, they thought that was delusion. Yeah. So they didn't believe, so there, I wasn't having psychotic symptoms. But the psychotic symptoms were not that I was being stalked and I was just lying in court. That was actually true. Those two statements were true. But they didn't do any testing of the world. Whereas I think the structure of masculinity, the kinds of violence that men experience to do with, for example, wars and larger structures are, are, are legitimized. Um, and I think that structure for me as a woman uh, there was a sense that no, I, I mean, repeatedly doctors would say to me that they had believed, not, not, not so to me, to my family members. So, for example, my dad met with um, my medical doctor, and this is after years, and he met with her, and she admitted to him that she hadn't believed my narrative about stalking. Yeah. So the whole time, for years, she was establishing what she, what dose she thought I was to be on, and she thought the stalking was itself a delusion. Yeah. And, and that wasn't true, true. but she needed masculinity to get my dad to tell her, no, 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 that actually, that was happening. And yeah, the court case was true. And he's sitting there telling her, and so I actually used to have a folder of evidence with me, um, and that my family knew I had this folder, because 
because I needed it because the, the hospital would let all of my world drop away. Yeah. So they wouldn't believe any of the things I was saying. And I think that's kind of an intersection between between the psychotic state, the, the ways that people who experience psychosis are considered not subjects, not witnesses to our own lives, who are not believable. Everything we say is suspect. Even small things, I'll say things that my friends will sometimes Sometimes they're right and they need to do a check-in, but a lot of times I'm actually talking about some weird, bloody thing that happened. And it's actually happening. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, um, so I just find it interesting that that's the sort of the over, overlay between psychosis and womanhood. And I'm, I, I'm not going to speak to this personally, but I think it's a similar overlay between the condition of blackness and psychosis, the condition of indigeneity and psychosis, so I think that there's a way in which there are structures outside of a white that are considered in that state, that are considered the unbelievable states, the positions you can't be speaking from, from as a legitimate subject, so that you are kind of fictionalized, you are kind of mythologized as a figure in other people's stories. Yep. I mean, like, we could just end it there on that super rich answer and be like, deconstruct that this week. There's... <laughs> Like, about 50 points I want to pick up on there, but I'm going to pick two that I think are most relevant for the context we've been speaking in all term. Because I'm also aware that there might have been points in that where you were thinking, oh, that was from this lecture. Oh, that was from when we talked about advanced madness kind of thing. One of them was the somewhat explicit claim there that while women aren't believed for their violence or they're being protected, there's kind of an implied binary of if it's a man, A, we're not protecting them, but B, they have more proclivity to be violent. And that's from our advanced madness lecture when I was talking about the overpathologization of Columbine or all the school shooters in the American context where as soon as it happens, all the debates are about which mental illness they had. Right, because that was the reason for their violence. So I think Erin's picking up on that really nicely. She brought up the is it hashtag believe women? Was that what it was? I believe women. I believe yeah. women. I yeah. Obviously, it's a response to the way that yeah. women's stories are always suspect. So it's not about you as if I was mugged or my heart, my heart was broken into. Our position is not normally immediate suspicion. Well, did you want your apartment broken into? And like, what did you do? Did you leave the door? Like, that, that's not our normal. And that is structure that comes back to yeah. women. So I understand the point of the hashtag. Yeah. But I also don't, I think it, it kind of, the structure itself negates women as a subject position. Yeah. Um, that we are capable of intensity. We're capable of, of publicity. We're capable of corruption. We're, we're, I don't want. I think it's troubling politically to have any identity category as a place of the, the, the structure of the, the, the truth or the structure of the absolute victim. Yeah. Does that make sense? And I, I, for example, it erases the role of white women within complicit slavery and accusing black men, for example. Yeah. So I think, but you know, it's a hashtag. I know it's doing political work. Yeah. It's just, I, I, and I've been in like positions where I had to testify. Yeah. So I understand the structure of the hashtag. I just, it's, it's probably why I'm not that good at Twitter. I'm just, I'd just, i rather write in that page. <laughs> You're good at Twitter. First of all, I do love the I Believe Women hashtag because there is a lot of that interplay there if you're really going to sit down and break it down, which I don't think most people are doing with the hashtag, right? But even stuff like when you're thinking about the Harvey Weinstein thing or X, yeah. you know, male that, you know, committed X offense, you could really put anything in there and that hashtag would work. Right? Yeah. And that's kind of part of the problem, right? It doesn't matter what the crime is. It doesn't really even matter what man or what ethnicity of man. It it comes down to a disbelief narrative. And that's kind of yeah. what we were talking about with Alison Harper Hitt's overcoming narratives. All the ways in which those stories get co-opted and redesigned in society to try to make your story tell a master narrative. Right? Uh -huh. So I was thinking... When you said the I Believe Women, do you remember, this was a couple of years ago, the I Am Not Dangerous hashtag? Oh god, I couldn't even partake in that. I was so upset by it. And also what you just said about the, the people, like I actually just shy away from the media every time as I'm not telling, because I'm just waiting, like, you're waiting for like, post the post it's just going to arrive, and they never go like, masculinity, gee, I wonder if there's something here, you know? No. It's just like the obvious, it's just like you're running around looking there must be some mystery. I wonder what is happening. <laughs> you know? 
like, wait. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, uh, and, but I know that it, it's kind of this private, like, in the DM, well, I mean, it's, you know, there's interviews that are happening on the little Twitter talk to me, yeah. where you're kind of like, oh, you're, I'll be in relation with people who are, like, writing the, the news yeah. forthcoming. And the news that often comes to is that the person is, when it's an adult man, there's been, like, multiple reports from women. Yeah. Because just around. one won't do it, right? If it's just uh-huh. one girl accusing, you know, particularly a high-powered white male or an executive yeah. white male, they're gaming the system. Yeah. 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 You need to have a. You need to have multiple. It, it's like it's kind of like some strange uh, recipe where you're like, okay, this we need to have or or balance sheet where you have to have like a hundred women. Although if the man has a lot of power. Even that, it doesn't seem to matter. It's just, it, it, We had, what, like, 12 women on Bill Cosby, and they were like, eh, maybe. And I'm like, okay, like, what's the number, right? Like, what number do we need? Yeah, I work with a, this is off topic, but I work with a great, great counselor, and so one of the things that I always tell people is that it's never about the number of women. It's about empowering women. Yeah. So I knew going into this, even before I was having what would identify as product TV, I knew my voice as well was not credible. Yeah. So I collect evidence. Like I have a folder of all the documentation. So I have. I don't. I don't have to be credible. I don't have to be listened to. Because yeah. I know that women don't have uh, any kind of credibility. Yeah. Our stories don't survive. So you, you, especially if you're a student within an institution. Yeah. Um, Make sure that you get the key the emails, keep the recorded voice messages, keep record if you have them in the office, play dirty. Because your voice, you, you do not have legitimacy. No. And I'll, I'll flag for the students listening, that's pretty much, you know, the object text of the students left behind lecture. We did right before reading week, and to catch Aaron up, the students left behind lecture was about, it was a dissertation chapter I did on students who had been expelled from the university for having either a suicide crisis or a mental illness episode or in my case my roommate died and they didn't have grief counseling so they expelled me instead and all the ways that that structure is designed to only cater to people who meet a certain expectation of the norm Right, so I think that's what you're picking up on really beautifully here and collecting that evidence and even the ability to prove like this policy is ugh, domino clearly, you know, not servicing anyone other than the institution. The ability to point to that didn't help anybody. Right? They just said, Okay, tough and they got expelled anyway. Which is you know, well, I, think about legal legitimacy, that you're a student and you have, you're in quote unquote mental health crisis and what you're going to take on the institution. Yeah. Don't you're, from a, you're from a structure of like not, of, of a kind of non-voice in that yeah. position. Like as soon as, as soon as, even those students are reports when somebody is shot, so they were in mental health crisis. But it's like, that, as if that deserved a bullet. Right? Where the kind of ends justify everything that came beforehand. Exactly. I missed that, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I said where the ends kind of justify everything that came beforehand. We neutralized it, but we neutralized it with incredible harm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the where I was tr- where I was eventually branching with that was the I am not dangerous hashtag I think picks up on A, what you were saying about the I believe women hashtag. Oh, your volume just went. Yeah, Domino's muting me. You're driving me nuts. Okay, Kat? Uh-huh. Um, but also, you did say that women were functioning for you as this structure of non-belief. And I think in the same way that I believe women is, is predicating that structure of non-belief, the I am not dangerous kind of did that for madness. Yeah. as this structure of non-belief where I need to literally put a picture of myself and explain to you why I'm not dangerous or why I'm not going to cause you harm or why I shouldn't be incarcerated. Yeah, I find that so troubling. I feel like we're testifying, we're trying to move. Um, I was thinking of one of 
far as work is the recognition. Like, like that we're, we're still positioning ourselves that you are going to choose me and you are going to hail me as not in your life. I've got to convince you of that. Yeah. And I think that kind of relationship to being able to hear the psychics and talk of stigma. I'm like, anti stigma campaign sounds so lovely, but the stigma implies that the mark on me. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, no, 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 the mark is on you. You're discriminatory. Yeah. There's no mark on me. I don't have to prove to you that I'm not here. There is not, there's no evidence whatsoever that I am. And like, it, it actually, the, what, what's happening is that, and you can see this around other structures of, of marginalization, where the person who's victimized by society becomes the, the agent. Yeah. Of, becomes seen as the agent of potential violence. Yeah. So you can look at the, the narratives of, uh, of, you know, Little House in the Prairie. So you're in the home of the settler colonialism, you have this constant anxiety of the, the indigenous person that could, that could re-enter the scene. And I think, yeah. um, I know in terms of the danger, that all these structures of uh, danger, well, what is happening to me? I'm being assaulted, I'm being penetrated against my will, I'm being yeah. held captive in a locked space. We have names for those things. Those yeah. are called physical assaults, sexual assaults, and kidnapping. Yeah. But those can happen to people who are mad. Um, or, or the larger structure uh, issues. So you can have somebody who's living without a roof over their head and is suffering from uh, deprivation in terms of nutrition. And that's not considered a kind of violence or a kind of suffering that we're creating and forcing other people to undergo. Yeah. But there, the homeless people are the ones that are dangerous and don't walk through that part of the neighborhood. You know, it's just, it's really interesting. It's, kind of, it's a kind of displacement that maintains both forms of like surveillance violence and brutal yeah. violence through abject attacks on the law. I love that. And I'm thinking, you know, to build on that, we kind of, or I'm generalizing here, but a lot of people kind of position it in terms of exceptionalities, right? Like, oh, most people might, you know, be, have a proclivity to that or become a Columbine shooter, but I know you and I know you specifically yeah. wouldn't do that or you don't have it in you or et cetera, whatever excuse they want to make. Or even if they're able to make the moral argument, no, I shouldn't put you on trial before I've got evidence. There's always an exclusion to that, right? Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah, people do that a lot, kind of exceptionalism. I'm sure you yeah. experience that. And I think there are ways in which I don't, I, that's why I like working in the form of nonfiction, because I don't speak yeah. for others, I don't make larger claims. But yeah. I think that the, what I like about, one of the struggles of mad politics is that we are, are quite different. Yeah. And so there is, there, it's hard to create solidarity, but I think that's the interesting fiber as well, is that yeah. we have to listen to each other and realize that positions of safety for one person aren't the same for another. And so it's much more tentative form of organizing. There isn't a kind of unified front at all. I mean, people can be opposed. Um, but I think in relation to, um, think, what was it back to danger? I'm still moving on that. I forgot my place. In reference to danger? Like the ways yeah. that we create exceptions to who is capable. Oh, exactly. yeah. yeah, I also think if you had, I, it was just bananas that I'll be at a, I'll, I'll present on stage, I can look at stage and see a university of Syracuse. And the, the first of it's really interesting that like white men with a microphone, like what they feel that they really should tell you. So this one guy got up and he was the second person and he was like, yeah, I was a little bit more. And I was like, you know, I experience boredom. I don't have to run out on the microphone right. in front of the theater. I experience boredom a lot. But I'm thinking the board is what's still here. And if we're such a person, you should just going to stay for an hour yeah. here. Like, that's not where I would need to express myself. But yeah. I also had to mess and ask me to say, oh, yeah, I don't experience you. I don't think that's actually psychosis, what you experience. And yeah. he was a psychiatrist. And so I was talking to an audience of psychiatrists. And yeah. they get the background. To say, what's happening is I'm on stage, they're having to be in the audience, they're listening to me. Yeah. And so what they do is go, oh, no, no, that can't have been a psychotic state. So you're functioning quite well. Yeah. So obviously, if you're not functioning according to my standards and my treatment, if you refuse my treatment, refuse my vocabulary, and you're still up there speaking, well, then maybe you're not, you obviously yeah. didn't experience the real thing. And I, I said, no, 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 I said I experienced delusions and hallucinations. Yes. And he still was arguing with me. And I was like, and what was interesting is that his position of knowledge and authority is absolute. So yeah. when I'm in a psych 
towards saying, I, I can get out. Yeah, I'm suing, but I'm working in the world. I know the difference between the disabled and, and someone who is floating around and not, and, and I, it's a fantasy. I can still be in the world. I can still be myself. I can still be with who I love. I don't need to be trapped in here. He still has the authority over my body yeah. and over my mind and over the claiming of my position. Yeah. And so it was like this kind of weird reverse of the other side of the page. So he, he was always in his position to be able to say, you're not going on it. Yeah. Even if you're there as a speaker for it, like you, you could use all the legitimacy in the world, right? You could yeah. say like, I've been cited 60,000 times and I am definitely psychotic. Here's all the institutions I've been to. Yeah, and if you present too well, you know, I've had people at conferences tell me like, you know, you would have never been able to tell that you're oh, schizophrenic. And I'm like, yeah. I think you were attempting a compliment there. But I'm going to tell you why that wasn't a compliment. Like, <laughs> no, no, I, I just said, I, I, I just said, I can't just say it's a creative document. I was in this uh, group of psychotherapy program I hated so much, and I don't yeah. care. You actually, everyone in the room is a video. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this program. So, and I just, I just can hope with it. I can go to school, and I can go to school, and I just wrote down all the ableist bullshit things yeah. that they said. Like, I just, yeah. I wasn't going to, like, publish it. No. But some of the things were like, they would say, well, I would call you disabled. And I was like, you know, and I would say, well, actually, no, I, what I experienced is disabling. Yeah. And I've been insulated politically as disabled, my rights are taken away as a yeah. disabled person. And I'm also disabled as about community and organizing. And I would say this, and they would say, they still position me as disabled, as just the exception. But the exception maintains the structure of oppression. Yeah. It's like, well, I like these Muslim neighbors next to me, but I'm going to still create. Like, it's this weird attachment. It's like a little kind of uh, structure in the oppression. It's like a little, the way that you need an escape valve to let pressure out of something. Yeah. It still maintains. Because they, they can't, they would, otherwise they would have to hold the combination. Yeah. I love that. I, I think that's a really good visual metaphor. And it's almost like it's kind of rewarding masking, right? Like you're telling me good job on yeah. being a palatable mentally ill person, right? And I'm like... Oh, yeah. Thanks. Like, I wasn't really looking for your approval. I was just speaking as an expert on this, but I'm really glad I got your approval in yeah. a heavily sarcastic sense. Yeah, and then, oh, <laughs> then you also turn to the institutions that yeah. suddenly completely ice you when you are symptomatic, and they're like, I'm like, wait, I applied for this postdoc as an yeah. openly mad person researching psychosis. Yeah. Using my own experiences. And they're like, yeah, but you came to this meeting and you weren't coherent. And I'm like, yeah, you let me in the program, me <laughs> the mad person, but like always on my best behavior, like I can yeah. never show up in the middle of a pandemic, no. not 100% okay, you know? No. So I had people who were showing up with like, you know, they, they could have children spinning on them, they could have dogs in the background barking, they could have this, yeah. but if I actually spoke any symptom of madness, I had to, it, it had to be stopped. Yeah. So that you can, you can, there you can, you and I can be in these spaces. But under that kind of category of research, we can't, we have to really be careful of what's happening, what we have to feel we can leave. Yeah, I love that. And I think I'll try to paint that for the students by saying a complaint that I say everywhere about the film Goodwill Hunting, which is another like, arguably mentally ill academic who's being you know triaged through the academic with the help of like golden savior robin williams like not to knock right. robin williams but his role in that movie is really problematic um and whenever what's his name matt damon is you know having madness or drawing on a foster background or really doing anything non-normative those scenes aren't filmed on campus. Those scenes are always outside his foster home or they're in parks with Robin Williams. They're not happening in Robin Williams's office or in the classroom. And the way that they've spatially divided that is on purpose. They're hoping you notice that because that kind of episodic, um, psychotic, any kind of mentally ill foray doesn't belong in that space even if the whole you know <laughs> branch of your character there's nothing really remarkable about will hunting besides he's super smart and he's mentally ill 
there's really nothing else to that characterization. So if you're saying you can only exist as 50% of your body mind in academic space, I mean, you could call it a productivity argument, but I'd also call it kind of a eugenic argument, right? Yeah. And, and this gets into the, the, the whole ways, all the forms of carceral yeah. um, containment yeah. of that. So that the site board functions as an internal board of the city. Yeah. And what's interesting is that academics who see themselves as progressive in other ways still really think that it's totally normal for police to take uh, students off campus into a hospital. Yeah. And if I actually say, well, actually, that maybe we shouldn't, that shouldn't be the structure, they'll say, oh, well, no, but they were mentally ill. And yeah. that there's no imagining outside of that framework. And, yeah. and I, I think, so what? They can still come to class if they're mentally ill. They can still be in the hallway. Yeah. And it, 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 so it's actually, it's not that you are actually threatening anything. You don't have to threaten something. Just yeah. your status as a mentally ill person within the institution yeah. is considered itself a threat. If you're going to be Matt Damon, be Matt Damon off campus, not yeah. in campus space, right? I, I hear you. I hear you. And without making that too, too, too complicated, I'm going to jump to another student question. And a couple of you asked this, um, and I think it's really interesting as kind of an explanatory way into some mad politics. They said, are there places in 2022 where medication is involuntarily given? such as uh, psychiatric homes or LTC long-term care homes? Yeah, I'm hoping to say that where you actually can refuse medication, and so far it's Norway. Um, I'm actually <laughs> going to be a Norwegian, so I'm like really proud of Norway. Because they just passed a law, 2016 at what, I think it was, and the precedent it was based on a woman's right to use. And they passed a law that you can refuse a psych med. Um, that you uh, can get care within a site system and you yeah. use the meds. And um, I don't know all of the provincial laws, how they're differently structured. There are different, what's the word? Um, I, just, I just blanked on it. Like, but, um, different thresholds. Yeah. So in BC, it is one of the worst in the country. I will say that you, I have zero rights. Yeah. I can be apprehended by the police. I don't have to be threatening anyone. I don't have to get threat self or other. I can just be apprehended, and that's the word apprehended. Mm -hmm. And it is a, it's a word that has meaning of understanding, to apprehend something, but also to a fear, apprehension, and also of physical force, you know, the fear yeah. of apprehending you. Just because I have a mental health issue, yeah. that's all they need. They need to identify that I'm mentally ill, and I can hospital and I will be held overnight in a little cell yeah. and and I have no uh, right to refuse that at all and if I say I don't want to follow the seal they'll hold me down and inject me yeah. and if I say to them when I was in the UK for example um, and I'd like to write about this because there's a way in which you cannot you, are, you have zero authority whatsoever so when you say I was saying I can't take a lot of to give me seizures yeah. I have a lower um, threshold for seizures than some I experience seizures in response, if I saw a lot of seizures, I have a lower yeah. threshold. A lot of seizures give me seizures. They, I, so I wasn't saying I'm the queen, I'm Jesus incarnate, everything. <laughs> this drug gives me seizures. Yeah. They just, that had no penalty. They just didn't want me. Yeah. Luckily, it was a low enough dose that I didn't have seizures, but they didn't know that. Yeah. And I've had anaphylactic shock. I've been hospitalized with anaphylactic shock in an ambulance for a drug response. Yeah. They didn't, and I kept saying, you don't have my and American medical records. Yeah. They didn't need them. I was just an object of their knowledge. I, I didn't exist within a history. I didn't even exist within a kinship. In the UK, the only people who could have brought me out were my old, uh, oldest relatives. My father, as a legal authority, to get me out. Even though I tried to create a kind of living will, it didn't mm -hmm. have any legal authority. So I had what I call my three husbands. And they were like, they were like yeah, not... I was thinking with none of them, but we were bad parents. But, um, so I had three men who were like tag teaming in terms of care and really wonderful people, and they couldn't get me out. So it was only my father, but my father was British. So my father had no legal authority, even yeah. if he came to the UK. Yeah. Because he was, he became, he became, so there was no one who could have gotten me out. Yeah. And I had zero right to refuse medication. Yeah. So it's a kind of, I, I write about the native exception, but it's a kind of absolute negation of your subjectivity. Yeah. Because you, you actually have a right, and you can, I, ha, I know someone who is refusing cancer treatment, and you have a right to do that. Yeah. Even if it's going to kill you. Yeah. Um, but you, I, I don't have, and I don't even have the right to do this, I don't need that level of drugs, and I can take this level of drugs. I don't even have that much ability to negotiate. So this is a structure of, of what 
Yeah. And I, I, I think it's really common for people not to know that. It's common for people not to know that handcuffs are completely normative and other response. That coming to a bed in Vancouver is a so being tied to a bed which made to a bed is a normal and a, and a legal form of care. Yeah. That solitary confinement is legal in Canada. That is for citation. That is a form of, of treatment. I don't think people grasp the level of punitive carceral response. Yeah. And I totally agree. There was a story, and I will grab the name after this lecture because her name is escaping me, but do you remember a couple years ago, there was a girl who was in, I think it was the KW penitentiary, so that's where we're based, um, and she had like a long string of behavioral issues and mental health issues, and they were putting her in solitary over and over and over again, and she killed herself. And they uh -huh. didn't end up finding the penitentiary liable for that, even though they could go back in the videotapes and the logs and prove like nothing positive was happening for her. Like there was really no route that would have ended positively for her. But that was a huge story. Did you hear about that one? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so sorry for whoever it is that I forgot the name. So the harm is focused on her body intrinsic to her. Yeah. That there is nothing, I mean, it reminds me, I'm it's a real shift, and I want to get back to that, like, the current uh, uh, DSM-5 yeah. prolonged grief being now diagnosable. Yeah. So that we're taking communities, most of the marginalized, racialized, disabled communities that are experiencing incredible amounts of grief of, of, of people, you know, in terms of their, their own uh, family or their communities, and we're making that psychological. So her, her suicide was locatable within her body and not within the harm, the dehumanizing harm yeah. that was... Uh, was used to, to quote unquote to meet her. Yeah. And I've got an essay, I haven't published it yet, but I'm on solitary confinement. Um, if I see it as a more torture, yeah. I've been held in solitary, nothing as long as someone who's been in prison. Yeah. But uh, it, it is meant to break your mind. It's yeah. used as a form of torture. And if you are in solitary, you are actually in form of that. Uh, there's no reality to yeah. You're not speaking to another person, you don't have a clock or a window. There's no way to orient yourself to the horizon. Yeah. So what for her to have experiencing that, I'm surprised that people can get through it at all. Well, that's, that was kind of the point of some of the more empathetic articles, right? When they're breaking down, you know, she had a number of prison sentences before that. But they were like, she wasn't getting medicated. She was refusing the mental health care they were offering because it wasn't good mental health care like we were talking yeah. about. And their solution, by and large, were punitive punishments every time she misbehaved. But we never created an environment where she could behave well and then uh -huh. penalized her for that, too. So it's kind of these stacked odds where she couldn't do anything right. And you get to the end of her story, and I'm like, I, I don't know what her options were besides eventually completing suicide because she's clearly never getting out of solitary, and she's clearly never going to get better treatment options. Yeah. And that also, the refusal itself being solitized. Yeah. So people will talk about going off your meds or the non non compliance. And what yeah. that does is structure up is an absolute monopoly of yeah. diagnosis, treatment, vocabulary. And if you, if you work without that vocabulary, you're just seen as refusing treatment and as non compliant and as pathological framework. So, you know, this, the first time you go to the psychiatrist, they, they just want, are you covering, are you taking your meds? Yeah. Like, and it's always this kind of pronoun, and I'm like, I always go dumb it. So, <laughs> no, I'm not on dumb it. Like, yeah. I'm not being dumb it. I want to get off that. But they're, not, they're not actually identified in my body, they're not yeah. personal to me. Um, and I find it interesting that that, that refusal isn't heard as a political uh, leverage, as, a, as any yeah. kind of political leverage, as any kind of statement or speech, it's just seen as a refusal of, 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 of some kind of knowledge that is seen yeah. as correct and is seen as, as, as care. And I'm yeah. thinking also in terms of agency that suicide, I, I, I don't want to romanticize the choice, yeah. but it is still a form of agency. And I was thinking of Jeffrey Andrews, three, three years, he's a 
Matthew of Monaco, who looks at suicide, suicidality, and its refusal of colonialism. And to think about moments of suicide, to grieve the death, and also to think about agency and what is being refused. And so this to not make suicide itself silent, but to make it, to make, like, and it's a form of, of uh, obviously, abstinence. But that her voice, throughout those moments of refusal, those were repeated statements, those, those are repeated legacy of her agency. Yeah, and I agree. That's a really tough topic, and I'll reiterate that in no way are we recommending or valorizing completing suicide. But I do think, particularly in the madness argument, there are people who politically choose that, right? Yeah. And we spoke a little bit about that in the C7 lecture when we were talking about euthanasia for the yeah. mentally ill. That's like a legalized way of saying, I'm selecting this. Yeah. In the sense of I said to Jeffrey, um, I said that uh, we were talking about one specific suicide, and I said it was a tragedy, and he said the tragedy is colonialism. Yeah. And, and I think we're naming the wrong things. When it's, it's sim and I don't want to say, I'm, I'm thinking with Jeffrey, I'm not, thinking, I'm not like using it as a, as a model to analyze my own experience, but I think for me, the tragedy has not been my psychotic the tragedy has been the institutional response yeah. to it. That has been what I've had to heal from. That's what I have nightmares about. I actually kind of, I'm like, you know, with the psychosis, it's kind of like surfing. It's not water, but I actually know how to surf now. Like I did not before, but now I do. And if I have a community of care with uh, people with me who can kind of go shoot in the rough water and I like, have ways of working with that, that is less frightening to me than to have all my agency taken away and to be locked up. Yeah. And uh, somebody asked, I thought it was a good question. I ended that piece with, with would you look me in the eye? And and that view is, you know, to the to the, to the psychiatrist and the nurses, but it's also to the reader. Yeah. Um, and because I find people, the eye contact, you probably don't necessarily, when you talk about psychosis, eye contact gets a bit weird. Like you just yeah. see it on the ground or something. I mean, I was in the UK, and then I just like, oh my God, you're on the ground. And I'm just sitting like, it's just what is happening here. And I'm like, really? It's not that scary. But um, the eye contact is interesting to me because I actually don't think it came from uh, guilt or shame. I yeah. think, I think or, some, or maybe the guilt of shame is deep down and hidden. Because I think it came from the sense that you are, it, it was so dehumanizing. It was just a sense that I didn't deserve eye contact. Yeah. It, it starts even before the assault. It starts the moment you enter the psych system. You're, you're not interesting. You're not engaged. There's no hearing. There is, you're, I felt like I was an object of yeah. their knowledge. Um, and, and I'm used to being, I come from a working class background. Um, but I'm personable, you know, I wear bright colors, I can walk into a train station, I have all sorts of ways that I'm intersecting with, with privilege, yeah. you know, race, specifically racial privilege, but other forms of privilege. I, I'm not used to having people look at me like an object, that I'm not even working, I can't be a dog. Um, and so that was just shocking to me in that, those spaces, I'm in those spaces for quite a long time. Um, and I think... With the violence, I think with the violence, like, there would be a kind of, when somebody's resisting, um, and I've seen it repeatedly, I've experienced it, and I've seen it, it looks the same as somebody resisting any other kind of assault. When a woman is resisting being tied down, it, she, her body is doing the same thing she would do if she was uh, resisting a gang rape. Like, it, it looks the same. So I think there would be a violence in a way. Um, but I also think I was interested in shame. Uh, my other, my training is in psychoanalysis, and I'm interested in some of shame, because I think what happens is, that people do feel shame, and then we became, we become the shameful thing. We're icky and gross, yeah. and you don't want to look at us, like we become the thing, so that, the, and I think, I'm thinking about this in my other work, so I'm learning one position with white supremacy, and what, the kind of work of shame we have to do, like what does it mean to actually experience your own shame? Um, and it's not in the kind of indulgent way where you're writing spring and fall and publishing it on you and your crap, but like actually sitting with it. <laughs> no, this is what we mean. <laughs> I, and I don't want other, I don't want the people writing poems about like they're going to be 
nice crazy email out. Um, like, I'm just like, but actually sitting with like, what, like turning it around so that yeah. instead of them looking at me, I'm looking at them. And it's yeah. something somebody said about, asked the question about, do I worry about people's response to me? I worry a lot about power. Um, that's my worry is like being on a campus. I'm someone, I'm like, I'm aware of what the security guards are. I, when I walk by cops, it is when I live in Norwich, you walk by the cops who handcuffed me. And they were just walking on the street. Like, I grew my hair different. I dyed it. I my bangs. I did a lot of things, so I couldn't be visible in the I was trying to escape my own brutality. So, I think a lot about control and the terms of openness. And I think about, about erasure and lack of credibility. And that people won't even believe the simplest things that I say. No. So, so those two things. Um, but in terms of interpersonal life, uh, I have a really supportive family. Um, I think it actually helps being from a working class poor family because I've like let no one down. It's sort of like normal life expectancy. <laughs> like, you got you raised all well, your guts, you know? <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> I've, I've actually been really lucky with a lot of like disappointment in their family, and I'm like, my family is just not. No. That it doesn't work. And they're kind of all like you know. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. people who hung out the death county side doing their thing. So I was just like, like yeah, yeah. Just, you know, it's fine. But um I actually think it's interesting, interesting in terms of dating and in terms of interpersonal life, because it's a good way to get rid of losers. Because I'm like <laughs> you know, I'm like if I kind of was a funny experience and you think like that you have to like like fuck up to be nice to me or something, yeah. or that you're tolerating me, you're like yeah. so boring. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I'm like, oh my god, your mind is so dumb. Yeah. Like, I just want to get rid of you. Yeah. And what I find interesting about this as well is you've noticed that there, there's all these interviews now, they're really interested in like um, magic mushrooms and all the space. So when same people trip out, they get on the fucking CBBC and they get an hour long interview about like, yeah. what magic mushrooms and how they open their eyes and they are not afraid of death now and all these sort of insights. Have you ever heard of Atmos of an art insight? Like, I can tell you all sorts of things that you get, like really weird senses of the design, the sense of our relationality with each other. And this is what one thing I find about my biggest, like, somebody asked me about this in terms of education, my biggest pushback is the point, the damage centered lens. And then that's about you talk to you and you not get a scholar pronouncing that poorly. She does it better. I look it up actually, but I know there's a squiggly sign over there. But she, uh, her thinking, she has a beautiful essay, which I encourage everybody to read. It's really studies going to social work, anything. It's called A Letter to Community. And it's, I'm forgetting the title, the last bit of the title, but it's on, it's on damage centered research. So it's like critiquing a model of damage centered research. And it is in some big journal like Harvard, something like that. It's available online. Harvard talking about it, so I get the big bucks. <laughs> Um, but this is like, if there's ever an essay, I'm sure you've had this, where like you want to have written this thing. Yeah. But it's like things that you felt all this time and you didn't have the vocabulary or structure for. It was like, I want to eat this essay. Yeah. Because in terms of low income family that have come and down to the side where my roots are and I work, and in terms of mad communities, disabled communities, in terms of indigenous communities that I work with and that she's yeah. from, not from, the, the framework is damage centered, that you are. You are your damage, you're going to yeah. narrate, you're going to give the research your damage, and by narrating lots and lots of damage, we're suddenly going to change society. And if that's a really faulty model of change, because what happens is it gets fixed in this damage center model, and we're the ones that are going to need help from others. And I actually think, like, what, I, I had a number of questions, and I like them, I think they're politically useful, to think, like, how can I help, what, what is necessary? Yeah. But I also am more interested in thinking, like, okay, how can I help you? Because you got some mad people here. Yeah. What what might our voices give to society? Because society is really fucked up right now. Yeah. And mad people, we can talk about interdependence. We can talk about the, what the mind can tolerate, what it can't. Yeah. We can talk about coming back. Like, for example, this pandemic, coming back from a collective atrocity, we've, we've come back from having our inside in complete chaotic disarray. Yeah. And I know how to return from that. Yeah. And I, but nobody's asking me, like, hey, can I get this? I'm struggling right now with this pandemic. And we're struggling as a society. And what I can say is, in fact, I didn't go backwards to the forcing. Yeah. Something 
else shifted. And so I have belief about what I lost through multiple experiences of acute disability, but I also know that I came through into some other kind of state. It was much more interdependent, so much more connected to family and friends. I'm much more attuned to language and power. Um, I was always thinking about power, but I'm more interested in thinking about it in terms of my new moments of speech that are positioning people as, the, as I said, the object of knowledge and not as within knowledge structures. And you know, within universities, that's what they do well. Yeah. And that's what, even when we think we're doing community based research or participatory based research, and I'm interested in encouraging that and being part of that, but structures of power are so inequitable and the structures of who benefits from these are so inequitable yeah. that it, it's like I think we need to do a lot more work about thinking so broadly about where does knowledge happen. Because mm. I'll tell you a lot of knowledge happens in a psych ward. Yeah. From, the, from the patients, between patients, a lot of knowledge happens on the street, between people who are living on the street, a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge about gender and desire and rupture and subjectivity from drug users. Yeah. So there's all of these places of insight, and I would like the university that isn't in a building, isn't in a degree program, that is actually just a we to teach each other, yeah. And we're going to care for each other. That we're always teaching. The four year old is teaching the mom how to care for the four year old. And that me and that person, I'm teaching, I could teach, not just because I'm a teacher, but because I have something to share. So I'm thinking about what if we have panels of people who are psych patients, not just like how do we improve the psych system, because that's kind of like reductive. But what, what do we need in society? What is different? What would have changed things to you? What kind of listening do you need? What does it mean to listen when someone is speaking a very incoherent and, and, and what feels incoherent? How do we sit with our own terror of that incoherence? How, what kinds of, we talk about crisis, I think crisis is really problematic because we're taking away the larger, uh, the, the structures that led up to the crisis. We're taking a large, a, a way the potential relationships that exist, that, that we take the person out of, that can help you the crisis. Yeah. So crisis is kind of like a, a simplified, it's like taking, taking one word out of syntax, or out of syntax and saying, we're going to just make this one word signify, yeah. and, but you, you remove me from all the paragraphs in my life. Yeah. And then you're taking this word and making me signify within your realm. I would have even said that about incoherence. Really, yeah. whenever I get that argument thrown at me in a venue, I'm like, well, what about it to you or in your experience was incoherent? Because I think, you know, had I said the same thing in the same way to someone in a separate community, I think they would have known exactly what I was saying. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's exactly. And also to think about communities that relationships matter in the theater, yeah. madness is the kind, I don't mean performance in terms of falseness, but performance yeah. is the largeness, like the largeness of the mad body. And it isn't that madness is considered often an individual disability, but man, it can be really difficult sometimes. Yep. <laughs> you know, and we have like large voices and large bodies, and we'll, we'll say things that you're not supposed to say, you're like, think that. Like, I'll be at panels, and I'll be like, you know, everybody's come to this light, and I'll start talking about it really loud, like, it's yep. like the period, when that's not supposed to be the thing that you want to And so, like, the idea of theater or the idea of poetry. Yeah. Poetry, we sit with poetry and we don't understand. With people who have degrees in reading poetry, and I'm not even talking about particular like language poetry, that isn't yeah. supposed to be referential. Yeah. So, what does it mean to be sitting with language that might be sound? Yeah. That might be rhythm, that might be contact that's moved forward, that doesn't have to have a reference. Yeah. Or that you sit with the reference and you play with it. And you think about what does it bring up inside me? When, when if, if somebody talks to me about purple, so they're going to about purple and purple and royalty, and they're all on the about purple and royalty. I'd be like, oh, is there a history? That's neat. And I, maybe I don't know the history, but I can talk about how I like purple flowers. Yeah. And we are having a dialogue. It's not like two poems talk to each other. Yeah. You don't have to have that sort of absolute diagnostic language of carrying this person back to what we call sanity. Yeah. I think we could tie that really nicely back to the way community functions right and how you know when we think of mad gang or mad community or even cds gang if you want to go a little bit bigger there are ways and triggers and buzzwords that you see in these communities that aren't meant to be coherent 
outside that community as a means of protectionism or a means of signaling, I get it, I'm in. And I'm not going to go into the mad ones just in case, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? As a way of signaling safety or safety teams or care networks. And those are very intentionally creating states of incoherence that I think are really interesting. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's interesting. I also have to think about reciprocity and yeah. thinking about that the mad person is within community and it's contributing yes. to community. It is not simply the object of the care system, but yes. it's actually in all sorts of complex ways of giving care. You are. And in a lot of ways, at least for the mad people we know, you know, it, it never even occurs to you as being optional. Yeah. Right? Like in some communities, it's particularly abled communities, it's really posited as you can take some of these resources, we hope you give some back. Whereas in other communities, it's like, obviously, I'm going to contribute to this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. I also think about vocabulary, and that's part of the reason I'm writing the essays the way that you'll notice. I mean, I write about psych systems, but I don't use psych vocabulary. Yeah. Um, it can exist, I think it can be helpful to people. This is again about how diverse our, our community is. That there are some people for whom diagnosis is meaningful, certain kind of uh, frameworks are helpful. I find them really dull, and I just think that they foreclose other, a whole possibility. Yeah. of what it could mean to be in care, to be caring for each other. Um, and even, there's a kind of monopoly, like a flow chart, this is my friend Richard Ingram talks about a kind of monopoly of psychiatry. Yes. There's a flow chart, like it's da 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 hospital, you know? Yeah. Like, and it stopped us thinking about oh, how am I really, like, I know, you know, warm life, I really like living in the dorm, I like having that own little space and then like a lot of people around me. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that we created these weird atomized home lives that for a lot of this old people, it isn't sustainable. Yeah. Like sometimes I do need someone to hang out with me. And now I have an apartment that's so small that it would be uncomfortable for them to do that. But but there isn't a, a, a former student of mine, you now friend, that has taught me like sometimes you do need to be in a space where there's care, where somebody's making sure that the meals are served because you are already in a kind of metaphor lane. Yeah. And but we don't we don't have a whole lot between atomized success, which is independent living, yeah. or the hospital, or like really often the homes that stay yeah. from Alboro, you know? Yeah. And that's where you pick up on some, you know, more radical CDS activists who are yeah. saying community is the only way forward. So yeah. collectives like Sins Invalid or Leia or Xena or people like that. The last question I want to pick up on, because I really, really love this question, what does your madness mean to you? Oh, I love that. I know. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting because it's taught me, um, I it's, it's a kind of, as a just bird just flew over it, quite um, I love it, but it's made me more attentive to, to two things like birds, miniatures, you know, like the small states, because when I'm ricocheting, I kind of try to use other kinds of words than pathologists, so I'll use a word like awry or ricocheting, um, shimmering, glimmering, those sorts of things. Those, so there was a state where things are so associative, and if I can bring myself back to the miniature, yeah. it's a real grounding, and it's going to help just be very attentive, for example, for good individual leads or to branch the swing, and so my madness has taught me that orientation to the miniature. It's also taught me a kind of expansiveness in terms of both interdependence and a sacred orientation, which is funny because in the medical system they talk about excessive religiosity, so it's only read pathologically, but I converted to Judaism partly because of my psychotic condition. So I was raised Catholic, so I, which was a religion I left, but I, I found the experience of psychosis was so profound, so expansive, um, so, like, there were moments of terror, but there was also these feelings of radiance and a sense of being on the edge, like, seeing the kind of veil that, like, yeah. of human existence. Like, not seeing outside it, but seeing the veil, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I wanted to practice. 
practice, a religious practice that would allow for that kind of vocabulary in a, in a non-medical life way. And so the first time I went to synagogue, I've been to synagogue for lectures, but as a service was the anniversary of my first hospitalization. It's a lovely story. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Like, and I love, I noticed in your text that you do stray away from things like dissociating toward associating. And I thought that was a really great implicit, you know, commentary on negative symptomology and flipping it yeah. to positive. Yeah, that was really clever. Yeah, it's and funny because you're dissociative, but I'm like, oh, it's at me and then the series of assets. Like, it's, it right? looks like people, but you were saying about sense. Like, if you take up moment of the free fall, I can tell you, it looks like random signifiers, just a list of like getting wrong, getting wrong, what's going on here, but if I take, I'll say, oh, that, that might look like a, just an arbitrary moment of speech, but I can unpack that and tell you where it fits back to story. Yeah. And I can tell you that in 2003, that word was significant to me because of this and this and this. Like, does that make sense? Like, yeah. And I don't want to get all madness loose into sense because I think there's something really interesting about experiencing the edges. Yeah. But then there's a lot more meaning, personal meaning and political meaning in our state that the psych system has to be any attention to. Yeah, and that's what proponents of anti-psychiatry and post-psychiatry are on about, right? Maybe they have a little more agency than we've been giving them credit for, and I think that goes back to what we were saying about coherence. And incoherent, yeah. just because it's not coherent to you in your experiences does not mean it is you know, objectively incoherent dialogue. It means you don't have the reflection space or the shimmer space or the kaleidoscopic uh, lens with which to see where the meaning was there. And we're willing to ascribe that to people like people who read Adorno. I love Adorno, but there are many sections where I'm like, fuck me, I don't know what he said there. And we don't call that incoherence. We blame ourselves for not getting that. If I wrote the same section, they would call it incoherent bullshit. Right? That's a really interesting relationship there. Thank you, Dominic. And then for Sarah, somebody, I was uh, about to struggle. Like, I struggle with grief, I struggle with rage, but a lot of loss. But I've come through it, and prose is harder for me. I find it harder to pull the whole book of prose and, yeah. like, put all the pieces together. I used to really, really crank theory and crank novels, like, just absorb them. But I'll now, like, look at a novel and I'll look at one paragraph for a whole day, and I'll be like, oh my god, I'm not reading. But what I realized is, like, oh, I am reading, but I'm reading it as if it's a poem. And so I've been working more and more on these kind of fragmented poetic texts, like, either these sorts of works that are lyric essay, or I started working, writing poetry late yeah. in my life. And it was partly because psychosis was a kind of teaching in poetry. Yeah. It was showing me, like, psychosis, I, I become, a, and I'm not alone, it's very kind of homonym, very attentive of rhythm, very attentive to the way of du double meanings in words. Yeah. Um, and so the, I just started to realize, why am I working so hard to be prose when everything is becoming poetry? Why don't I just write yeah. poetry now? just leaning into, you know, I'm a really miniature state person. Why yeah. not lend yourself to miniature state prose? I, I love that. Yeah. I am going to cut us off here, unfortunately. Thank you to those of you who made it to the end of this video. I hope you did, because I find Aaron just hopelessly interesting. I just, I could sit here for the rest of the night, but maybe you have things to do. That's fine with me. Uh, she might have things to do as well. I'm just selfish, you know? You know me. Thank you so much to the illustrious Dr. Aaron Soros, and we hope to have you back in future semesters. That would be really wonderful and lovely. And your right space for this week will be about the activist context in the conversation that happened today. So you'll get a transcript of it on the Discord, you'll get the video obviously tonight, and then you're using those to create your own response dialogue as to how to take the meaning making that goes on in LXP and turn it into something that gestures toward how that's usable in activism. And I will post that also on the Discord. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next week.